There is only one challenge we've made Hector do that really upset him, and if you recall, it was our very first one. Hector was sent to prove that you can 1v2 a lane in gold, even with an AFK support. It wasn't the challenge that tilted him, but the fact that the video got a ton of comments all saying the same thing. Oh, it's much better to have an AFK support rather than one leeching your experience and giving away kills. Such incredibly fair comments made us recreate this challenge, but we've made sure to cover that ridiculous advantage this time around so he doesn't have such an easy time of it. This time, instead of disconnecting his support, he'll have a Yumi attached to him the whole time doing absolutely nothing, just leeching his experience to make sure that previous problem isn't there this time. And don't worry about that 5 bonus AD he'll be getting from the Yumi. We've got that covered this time as well, as he'll be randomly sending his Yumi to have a little accident every now and then to offset that crazy massive buff. On top of that, he did the challenge twice, both times versus unwinnable lanes. Ash into Jin and Pantheon is impossible to 1v2. Misfortune versus a Draven who has a Shaco is going to be incredibly annoying, as Misfortune can't even 1v1 a Draven to begin with. Instead of dominating them 1v2, in this challenge, we'll be covering how to survive hard lanes with a useless support and make sure that you can scale regardless of the circumstances presented to you. And with all those rules in mind, let's get into our missions. We've done a Hector challenge before where we tested whether or not you can 1v2 as an ADC with a literally AFK support. That game may have set the standard too high though for what you can and can't do since you can't always beat an enemy lane by yourself. Trying to do so versus a Samira and Leona as a Jinx, for example, would just end up with you dead on the ground. So, with this challenge, we'll be seeing how you can survive despite your support being AFK. The challenge was done in an Ash vs. Jin and Pantheon game as well as a MF vs. Draven and Shaco game, so we can see varied examples of what may happen when your support is doing nothing. Let's get into it. For these types of lanes where you can't hope to ever win 1v2, here's the new set of missions you'll need to employ. Mission number one is to farm passively and avoid trades altogether. This obviously depends on your support, but if your Janna is literally just pressing E and doing nothing else, then yeah, it's okay to not try and win the laning phase that game. Don't force something that you can't do. Which makes mission two simply to let the wave shove. By letting it come into you, you can make the laning phase very uninteractive. You don't have to engage your opponents if the wave is always coming into you and you can freely farm. Likewise, if the wave is ever pushing away from you, you'll need to do whatever it takes to crash it into the enemy tower so it slow pushes back to you off the bounce. And your final mission is to play around dives. Since you want waves constantly pushing toward you, the enemy might set up a dive with a big wave crash. Here's all you have to do. Make sure you thin it just enough to where it's still pushing to you, but all enemy wave crashes are very weak. It's much harder to set up a dive when the enemy crash is just 6 or 8 minions, as it doesn't give the enemy a lot of time to set up. Also, make sure to remain at 100% health at all times, if possible, which goes hand in hand with our previous missions. It's much harder to dive someone early game who is sitting at nearly full health the whole time. Alright, on to the guide. Like we said, there were two different games done, and we'll be switching back and forth quite often between them to see the similarities of what was done, but also how to approach a few different scenarios you might encounter. Let's actually start with them side by side though, since they are incredibly similar in how the early game plays out. Like we said, his goal is to just farm passively and let the wave shove into him. There will never be any differences in the early stages of the game as long as you don't initially auto the wave. It is guaranteed to push into you since your opponent will be last hitting more freely. Of course, as previously mentioned, he'll be sending his Yumi to die at random times, and he immediately does so during the Misfortune game. Now we can explore some different situations which might occur. In the MF game, with his support dying, the enemy opts into crashing the wave and taking a recall to spend all the gold that was just gifted to them. Obviously, this created a slow pushback for the enemy team. So, Hector makes sure to crash it into their tower while they're gone, so that the wave will be pushing back into him when he gets back. A very simple mission to accomplish. Keep in mind that this would probably not work against a competent support. If the enemy Shaco was smart, he would have stayed to make sure Hector couldn't crash and maintained a freeze for his Draven. But, that's not the point of these Hector challenges. The point is that it is irrelevant what your own teammates do, because your opponents also have no idea what they're doing. 
Since strategy isn't a thing in low elo, Hector gets away with being able to crash this and set up his own recall. During the Ash game, Hector didn't have his Yumi die yet, so the enemy hasn't recalled. They crash the wave, and this creates a bounce back slow push. Oh no, the wave will be frozen against a Pantheon. It'll be lights out for Hector. Wait, wait, wait. That's right, we're playing in low elo. This Jin would have to be patient for like at least 30 seconds and allow the wave to freeze to enable his melee support. That's a concept we constantly go over because of how important it is to do. Thankfully, 30 seconds of patience is a lot to ask for apparently. Your opponents in their short-sightedness are very likely to just autopilot hit the wave, so they'll just keep shoving it into you without thinking about any future consequences. Notice how they're trying to land AoE abilities without thinking about how that affects the wave. Very rarely will you go against someone genuinely competent in wave management, so you shouldn't be too worried about bounce back freeze setups as they are unlikely to happen. The point that we really want to drive home, as we always do, is that you are not playing against Reckless, Uzi, or Deft. Your opponents are always doing something wrong that you can exploit, regardless of how bad your own teammates are. Alright, back to the MF game. After crashing, he recalls and comes back to lane. The wave was built up quite a lot, so he begins thinning it so that there is no twisted fate dive shenanigans being set up. You always want to ping away your junglers in situations like these where the enemy wave is massive. Minions are very powerful in the early game, and you can easily be 3v2'd if you overextend into big waves. Then the 4-man dive that was likely incoming converges onto the overextended Sejuani instead and Hector manages to turn it into a 1 for 1. The bit of thinning that he did before all that was so important as it kept a crash relatively small. It doesn't give the enemy team a lot of time to set up onto him, so the possibility of the remaining three members diving him was completely negated as well. Right after all of that, as Draven and Shaco continue to shove, LeBlanc comes down for a gank resulting in a fairly free kill onto the Draven. We have to admit that this was something that was fairly consistent in both games where Hector was the one receiving way more ganks than his opponents, despite it being something he didn't really want or need. Try to keep in mind that this is just the benefit you get from playing passively. If you're playing safe, you'll receive way more ganks since your opponent is likely playing aggressively. For reference, if you watched the previous challenge, Hector was the one on the offensive, pushing into Kaisa and Lux the whole time. As a result, he was the one that was ganked by literally every member of the enemy team. In high elo, conceding lane priority is generally pretty bad. It gives your opponents free roaming, recalling, and vision opportunities that could help them get ahead. But your opponents won't abuse that in low elo. So don't feel bad about playing passively all game when it's the correct play. More often than not, letting your opponents shove will just end up with them being ganked, since they don't know how to play around the jungler. All right, back to the MF game. After that lovely LeBlanc gank, Hector clears out the wave and begins walking forward. What do you think the best play here is based on our missions? So if you've watched some of our minion manipulation guides, you'd know he's about to implement the freeze denial. What he does is walk past the enemy tower, tanking the wave so that his own wave will crash cleanly for a bounce back slow push. The reason he did this is because he didn't have the mana or the items to push this wave out before his opponents got back to lane. Draven and Shaco would get back in time before he's finished crashing the wave and could set up a freeze. That would spell massive trouble for someone who is playing 1v2, and Hector does not want to be in big trouble. Now you may have a concern. We saw Ivern top, but the enemy team had a twisted fate. What if Hector just got ulted as he did this incredibly risky strategy? That brings us to the final point that we want to make about this guide, which is that random kills and deaths don't really matter all that much. There is a reason that he was quite comfortable sending his Yumi to die two or three times each game, even versus a Draven who gets a free cash in. Players care way too much about whether their support dies a couple of times during lane. Kills aren't that important, it's what you get or deny off of a kill that matters far more. Think about it. When you die with a huge wave at your tower and you miss all of it while your opponent gets three turret plates and dragon, now that feels pretty bad. But if you're to die and you just come back to a bunch of farm anyway, it doesn't really matter that much. The kill in isolation is only worth 300 gold, which is literally just a dagger or boots. It is not game changing, which negates the point of Twisted Fate ulting down anyway. Hector had already achieved his goal of creating this bounce back slow push. 
Even if he had died, he would still be coming back to this big wave he had set up anyway. And at this point, we have to admit that that was really all there was to this challenge. He continued playing safely and managing waves so that they would always be pushing to him. Even when he sent his Yumi to die multiple times, the enemy team was unable to prevent him from farming. Yeah, you can't always dominate your opponent's 1v2 with a bad support. But if you can't win, then just play passively until the enemy makes mistakes like overextending to ganks. The Ash game was a complete jungle diff unfortunately due to Echo, so he didn't really get to play much after the initial lane phase. The MF game, on the other hand, he was able to begin playing aggressively once he got his Gale Force, despite Draven getting cash-ins from Yumi. His first play was his trademark Dying to Shaco clone in every guide he's part of. But besides that obvious mistake, he was extremely farmed, so it really didn't matter too much. As an ADC, if you're CSing well and not falling too far behind, you will do good damage and should be able to punish your opponent's mistakes even on your own. Remember everyone, just don't tilt when you have an AFK support. Yes, it's incredibly boring having to passively farm and do nothing, but saying that you just get run over isn't really true in low elo. Players don't know how to punish you, and if you're playing well, you should be able to at least scale relatively well with good farm. Anyway, that's going to wrap up this guide. Here's a couple of really easy to hit missed arrows to get you through your week. And as always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.